everyone. We are now recording. I'm excited. Excited. Today is November. Yeah, it is November the 17th, Thursday the 17th. And uh, students, remember, I'll have a recorded version for you for next week because we will be 24th will be Thanksgiving. You'll be, be enjoying your turkey and your family and all of that. Uh, stay safe. All these germs and flu still going around, even if it's not COVID, but just stay safe. We are, let me share my screen. We are excited to have a um, guest lecturer with us today, and I'm going to introduce uh, Brother Ward just a little bit later. So we're so thankful that you're with us, Brother Ward. Um, thankful to be here. <laughs> All right, everybody, I hope you can see my screen. We're going to go to, yeah, we're going to go to week seven. So everybody make sure you check out your announcements for week seven. Um, if you haven't done so already, just another reminder to make sure that you register for classes for the spring. All right, we got an assignment. We got an assignment this week, and I know we're probably pacing ourselves with the holiday if you have family or you're traveling, so make sure you pace yourselves if you are traveling. Your key thing, no forum this week, no forum this week, but we are going to be in Deuteronomy, so I want you to make sure you take a look at the PowerPoint lesson, um, and then there is a very helpful video right here where it says Book of Deuteronomy Explained. Lane. Um, I think you're going to have a very good understanding of the book after this lesson uh, with Brother Ward. Now, your assignment this week is the Old Testament book outline. Let's look at that Old Testament book outline. So for this particular assignment, as I was saying earlier, everybody, I, I just I get excited about this course and really all of our courses, but I get kind of sad because we just can't get through everything like with the New Testament course and our Old Testament course, we can't hit all of the books. It really would be it really would be kind of hard and impossible. Even in seminary, you can't hit, hit all of the books. You really just kind of get a cursory and then, um, you know, sometime in seminary, I would take a particular course that focus right on that book and it just oh my goodness it just opens opens your eyes so this is your opportunity to delve deeper into one 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 just one old testament book don't don't choose all of them just one old testament book with the exception of psalms don't choose psalms okay because it's a little bit different with psalms you have um many psalms so with the exception of psalms i want you to pick one old testament book that you are curious about there are five questions that you are going to identify in your research who is the author of the book or who do we think is the author remember we talked about authorship sometimes it is attributed to an individual and we kind of don't really know but you're going to say who is it attributed to who do we think it is now you're going to do some research also in number one and when was it written remember we don't have exact dates because don't nobody really know but like when was the when do theologians think that this particular book was written? Number two, I want you to take a look at that book. It's always good to have the paper Bible with you and see how the book is introduced. Did it start off? You know, how did it start off? How did it progress? What's happening in the beginning chapters? You know, number three. You're going to explain how this book of the Bible progresses in activities. There's no need to explain every chapter. Like if you got 30 chapters, I don't need you to say in chapter one, it did this. In chapter two, we'll be here forever. But you're just going to kind of give a summary of how how the uh, uh, this particular book progresses, maybe with a group of people or maybe certain people emerge in your book. Number four, I want you to identify one, 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 just one, one main character of that particular book. Let's say if you're doing Ruth, maybe you talk about Ruth, maybe you talk about Naomi. Why is this particular person significant to that particular book of the Bible that you chose? Talk about them. What did they do? OK, and does the person change over the course of time? Some people might. Um, 
die at the end of your book. Some people move. Some people uh, get a different ministry in your book. So that's really exciting. And lastly, number five, how does this book of the Bible end or conclude? Uh, was there a particular victory? Did someone die? Uh, like in Deuteronomy, we're going to talk about today. Was there a particular um, uh, uh it, most of the endings are kind of dramatic, so I'll just put it like that, okay? So for this week, you're working on your Old Testament book outline. You're going to choose one book that you are just interested in, with the exception of Psalms, okay? All right, let me just pause real quick. Any questions? All good? All right, all right. Let me know if you have any questions along the way. So remember, no form this week, okay? No form this week. All right. Let me go and let's, we're going to pull up your lesson here and we're going to do our introduction. Give me one second. Pull up our PowerPoint. All right. All right, everybody. So we're going to pull up our lesson. But before we pull up our lesson, I want to take this time to introduce to you a very, very, very good friend of mine and co-laborer in ministry, Brother Henri Ward. We serve in ministry together at Shaw Temple AME Zion Church in Smyrna, Georgia, where he serves as an exhorter on the ministerial staff. And um, an exhorter is, and Brother Ward will, will share because we just have a running joke with him that he needs to be an ordained um, minister. <laughs> but he's like, no, y'all should have that. Oh, he need to be a pastor, okay? But we're just gonna leave that alone. He, in addition to in addition to serving on the ministerial staff, he is a wonderful instructor. Brother Ward, you did not put this in here, um, and I'm gonna get you. But he is a Sunday school teacher, and when he teaches Sunday school, you are in for a seminary lesson. He is not gonna give you just little skimmy things that um, from the scripture, but he really, really digs into uh, the lesson and you just come out like, wow, I didn't know that. In addition, for many years, Brother Ward served as an instructor of Old Testament theology and survey of Christian theology at our Shaw Temple Biblical Institute. In his other life, in his professional career, he is very deeply rooted in uh, growing domestic and global businesses. So he is currently the chief operating officer of B Direct, and this is a multinational startup uh, laser focused on disrupting the corporate board training and placement um, in marketplace. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about that. In addition to um, his theological studies, he holds a BSBA in informational systems from Xavier uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he is a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt certification from GE, General Electric Company. Um, Mr. Ward and his wife, we affectionately call her Tony, but Antoinette, they live in Metro Atlanta area. So I just want you all just to welcome, welcome, welcome Brother Henri Ward uh, to our uh, class as our guest lecturer today. And Brother Ward, we, have, we are recording, so just wanted to let you know we're recording for our other students who will watch uh, the, the video later on in the evening because many are working and things during sure. the daytime. Sure. All right. So um, we are students. We're going to jump into and pull up my lesson here. We're going to jump into Deuteronomy. Hold on. Let's see here. You don't want to download. Come on, let's download. There we go. All right, everybody, let me know when you can see my PowerPoint on the screen. Mm. 
Mm -mm. I did that wrong, y'all. Let me do it again. You see the ugly version. Let's get the good version. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you can see our um, PowerPoint on the screen. We can see it. You can see it. All right. I think I still did something wrong, but we're going to make it work. <laughs> I did do something wrong because I can't see it in the full screen. Can you see it in the full screen? No, we still see your, your banners. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Okay. I know. We're going to get it right. Boom. I think we're good now. What about now? You see full screen Deuteronomy, Book of Deuteronomy? We see it, but it's yes, still I can got. See it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right, everybody. So remember, let's do a little review. We have gone through uh, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, uh, Numbers last week. We did Numbers last week. Um, numbers, we had a great discussion, Brother Ward, on Numbers last week. Somebody tell me what was... Uh, what was the purpose of numbers? What was what was the purpose of numbers? To get a count of how many. It was the count. It was the census, right? Census. There you go. And we were discussing last week, Brother Will, we said, you know, when we thought about it, you know, not many of us preach or taught from numbers because it was just a book of numbers. And um, one of, we had a really good uh, discussion of one of the awesome stories that we get from numbers is um, the daughters of Zelophehad and uh, some of the stories and the, the um, encouragement that we received from them. But yeah, so numbers was just that. It, it was a census. We got a chance to see how many uh, individuals were moving through all at one time. All right, so now we're going to move into the book of uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, Brother Ward, I'll just do an introduction and then I'm going to uh, pass it over to you. Okay. The purpose of this particular book is to basically just that, to renew the covenant with um, the Israelites or the Hebrew people. Remember last week, as we talked about numbers, remember they're continuing this exodus, right? So it's each book plays off each each other. So they're, they're, they're moving, they're uh, moving as a group because they were exiled from Egypt and they are just having a time. Last week we talked about Moses and Moses was getting a little perturbed with them people, right? Um, getting a little ticked off because of, look, I'm telling you to do certain things and now you don't want to do it. And we're whining and they, <laughs> and they want to go back to where they were. Here's the key thing. So now they are, um, preparing to enter into the promised land. Now, remember last week, what what happened? Is Moses going to make it in? No. No. Nope. Moses didn't make it in. Well, we'll see that here in Deuteronomy. But what was the reason why? He beat up the rock. He beat up the rock. <laughs> he beat up the rock, Reverend Marshall. Uh, he got tired of them people. Uh, you you want some water? Okay, I will give you some water. And and did not do things uh, in order, uh, following the rules that the Creator God gave him. In Deuteronomy, we have in all of the books of the Pentateuch, we have history. So Deuteronomy, we think it may have been written in the latter part of the seventh century. So I want you to catch that there. Um, it, it, now, I want you to see that Moses is not thought to be the author of this particular book. 
He could be. However, he's a very dominant voice. We do see that the death of Moses occurs. We will see as we talk a little bit more that the death of uh, Moses occurs in the book. But the way Deuteronomy is written, it seems like perhaps Moses may have had a hand in it, but maybe not really have written um, this particular book for Deuteronomy. OK, so now I am going to pause a little bit. Uh, Brother Ward, would you like me to keep this slide up as we talk about the outline of the book? Um, that's fine. OK. So it's you, you ready for me now? Yes, you can go ahead. OK, great. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Reverend Barry for the opportunity to come and, and speak with your class. It, it really is an honor. Um, before we actually get into the, the details of, um, of Deuteronomy, I first just, I think it's important for us to kind of uh, set the stage a bit. Yes. And um, a part of that is m much more from a macro level of, of the Bible in general, and then we'll get into Deuteronomy in specific. So, um, the way that I like to kind of start out these type of discussions and talking about the Bible is that many times people view the Bible as a history book. And the Bible really is not a history book. It's a book that contains history in it, but it also contains other forms of literature like poetry, um, legends, it also contains um, what we call the Book of Wisdom, uh, which are you know, Proverbs and, um, and Job. So they're all different types of forms of, 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 of literature within the Bible. The other thing that's important to understand, and particularly as we start talking about Deuteronomy, um, the other thing that's important to understand is that the writer or school of writers, as is the case sometimes, is not an innocent bystander. The writer comes with their own opinion and their own biases. And many times those biases are woven into the text that we read. And so what theologians like to say is that the Bible is um, inspired but not inerrant. And what that means is that even though um, there are biases built into the text, uh, God still speaks, right? Even through the biases, even through the opinions. Now, now we get into the book of Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy is actually um, a part of a seven book volume. And just like when you begin looking at the New Testament and you talk about um, Luke, and we speak of Luke in terms of Luke Acts, right? Um, we speak of them together, Luke and Acts being kind of a two volume set. The book of Deuteronomy is really a seven volume set that begins with um, Deuteronomy, but ends with 2 Kings all written around the same time by the same uh, group of folks. Um, so the seven volumes include, I'm, I'm sorry, the seven books within the volume include Deuteronomy, Judges, Joshua, First and Second Samuel, and First and Second Kings. Now, if you were to be flipping through your Bible, you'll notice that I didn't mention one name. And that name is Ruth. So again, the, the seven book volume is Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. The reason that I didn't mention Ruth, and this is kind of all setting the table, the, the reason I didn't mention Ruth is what we read today is a Christianized version of the Hebrew Bible. Um, the Hebrew Bible is called Tanakh. 
and out. I don't know if you could see this or not. Um, T A N A K H, Tanakh. And Tanakh is actually divided into three different sections the law, or the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. The law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, Book of Deuteronomy ends the teaching on the law as a part of Torah, right? So you've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So it ends the Torah, but the um, what we'll get into talking about the Deuteron Deuteronomistic history, try to say that five times fast, <laughs> um, actually it encompasses these seven books. And Ruth is actually a part of what we call the writings. And in the writings, um, you have um, Psalms and um, First and Second Chronicles. You also have Job, uh, Ruth. All those are considered a part of the writings. Um, Song of Lamentations, all a part of the writings. So it's it's important for us to understand that the scriptures surrounding Deuteronomy just aren't Deuteronomy. It's this set of writings that also go through um, also go through Second Kings. As Reverend Barry was saying, although Deuteronomy is ascribed to Moses, theologians are pretty sure that um, Moses did not necessarily write the text, you know, particularly when, uh, you know, some of the other texts take place after his death, right? So there's a school called the Deuteronomistic history or the Deuteronomistic historian. And I'll spell that out. D-E-U T E R O N O M I S T I C Deutero Deutero, which means two or second, nomistic historian. And what theologians believe is that um, the book of Deuteronomy was actually written by the Deuteronomistic historians in order to provide a set of rituals in order to provide um, a kind of second law, a second canon for Israel. Uh, now, remember from your prior history, you understand that Israel was divided up into two kingdoms, right? Um, there was the Northern Kingdom of Israel, there's the Southern Kingdom of Judah, and then you get the uh, Babylonian exile. And what happens is that when Israel comes back from exile, um, a combined canon or a combined Bible does not exist because you had um, one canon being used by the Northern Kingdom of Israel and another canon being used by the Southern Kingdom of Judah. And what we get with Deuteronomy is this combined canon where the Deuteronomistic historians, um, which we believe are actually Levite priests. And more specifically, um, the Shiloh priests of the Levitical priesthood. What they do is they bring together um, existing religious laws admonitions, songs that had been developed, as Reverend Barry was saying um, earlier, beginning in the eighth century, um, you know, 700 BCE, 
and, and we say BCE versus just BC um, because it's it's um, um, BCE stands for before the common error, right? Because if you're not Christian, you, you don't necessarily date things from Christ. And so um, before the common error, but what, what you have in Deuteronomy really is this set of admonitions, song, religious rites that the priest are actually putting together for the people. Here's, here's another thing that you have to understand when, you, when we look at the time of Deuteronomy. It's very important for centralized um, sacrifice. During the time of the writing and during the time that this writing was being actually um, implemented within um, Israel, you had um, sacred rituals that were taking place in different places. You could have multiple temples, if you will. One of the purposes of Deuteronomy and one of the reasons of the Deuteronomistic historian is to centralize worship and to centralize religious sacrifice in Jerusalem. Um, there can be only one temple. Now today, if you would talk to those who are Jewish, you know, we might say, um, or they might say they're going to temple, right? Uh, meaning synagogue. Um, within this context of when Deuteronomy uh, was being written and during the context of when uh, the book of Deuteronomy uh, was being executed by the priest, they wanted to make sure, particularly the priest of Shiloh, they wanted to make sure that there was just one temple and that was the temple in Jerusalem. And that's where all sacrifices had to take place, um, was in Jerusalem. And so what, what, what Deuteronomy gives us is this storyline of Moses, but it's the storyline of Moses through the lens of the, of the Levitical priesthood. And so many times what you see is you will see, um, and this happens actually several times in other parts of the Bible, where you will see um, the thoughts of the priesthood being mouthed through the mouth of Moses. And that's important to understand because again, and it goes back again to this context of the writer is not an innocent bystander, right? The writer of the, yes. Brother Ward, pause right there. You brought up something really good. Um, when you talked about the words, okay, you say the Levitical the priests, mm -hmm. um, you can really see that they, they had their hand in this writing because it's mm -hmm. priestly. Um, if y'all don't mind, uh, Brother Ward, go to De Deuteronomy 1 and 1. This, okay. clearly, this clearly says what Brother Ward was saying. Um, students, if you have your Bibles, go to Deuteronomy 1 and 1. And Brother Ward was just saying right there, and I had just pulled it open. It was like it just came alive. Your words just hit right here. Brother Ward was saying that this writing... The book of Deuteronomy is a priestly writing written by, by the Levitical priests, right? And Brother Ward, look at verse one. It says, you got, you got it. Mm -hmm. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. That is in the, is that Arabah? Opposite of Sus between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. Dizahab, hope I got that right. So even opening, in the opening of Deuteronomy 1, verse 1, mm -hmm. 
Brother Wood, we have exactly what you said, that, that evidence that these pre, it's, I don't want to say putting it in his mouth, putting the words in his mouth, but mm -hmm. they're speaking of him, would you say? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what happens, and this gets into more of a, a broader discussion when we look at um, analyzing Old Testament, and, and, and Reverend Barry, I'm not sure if you, if you dealt with this in your class or not, but um, uh, JEPD analysis, um, the documentary hypothesis, I'm no, not sure. um, not so much here. No. Okay. Um, okay. No, and that's fine. And that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, what what we understand is there are are multiple writers at work within the Old Testament. Um, even when we begin um, the Book of Genesis, the Book of Genesis begins Barashit Elohim. In the beginning, um, God created. Um, Theologians uh, understand that to break it down into um, what's called JEPD, J, -E -P -D, J um, which God being referred to um, in the name of Yahweh. And of course, um, J uh, being kind of, it, it's J in English, but it, it's kind of Y in the Hebrew. Um, so Yahweh. The E is God being named as Elohim. The P are the priestly writings, um, Leviticus, Numbers. Um, and then D, which is Deuteronomy or the Deuteronomistic historian. And so what we see in Deuteronomy is the priest who are now coming back out of um, Babylonian exile need to put together a canon, but they need to put together a canon that speaks to where the people are in terms of religious rights. So the people have um, the law, right? They have the law that's, that's given by Moses, but what the book of Deuteronomy does from the priest perspective is it begins to become the second law or the deutero law because the people need to expand upon what was just given in the 10 commandments and so what the priests do and i'm, I'm going to take a step back many times we view we view history from a Western perspective. And what I mean by that is uh, we view history from the perspective of, well, if it's written there and if they said it happened, it must have happened. And the reality is that writers of ancient texts didn't view literature that way. They viewed literature as um, a, um, in, in many ways, an apologetic text. Um, and I'm sure when you get to your new history, uh, your New Testament, you know, you'll talk about the um, apologetics. But it, it's, it's what the writers are doing in Deuteronomy. And when I say writers is because you have a school of priests that are writing these texts. And what they're doing is they're trying to put together a sense of community for people. And they use this text as a forum for, for putting together that sense of community. And Moses becomes the vehicle in which they do that. Moses in um, ancient Israel as today is considered the preeminent um, you know, person that God spoke to, right? Moses is considered the preeminent um, um, figure that God uses. And so what the priesthood does in terms of putting together a structure, a liturgical structure for people to follow is they 
use Moses as a way of delivering the message as to how people should use, live their life. And so what you see from the beginning of Deuteronomy where you know Moses is speaking to the end of Deuteronomy where Moses dies, it's a storyline. It's a storyline that the priest create in order to give the people a sense of what it is that God is looking from them, looking to them to have, and what it is that God is looking from them to deliver back to God. Um, and the Deuteronomistic history, again, begins with Deuteronomy, but it doesn't end until 2 Kings. And in there is interwoven historical fact, but also is interwoven um, opinion and also is interwoven um, ad admonitions to the people regarding how they should perform um, ritualistic sacrifice to God, as well as how they should perform religious rites. So when we look at the text, um, and, and I'm, I'm glad you all are taking, the, taking this class from a critical analysis perspective, um, and not just from a um, religious conformation perspective. Because when we look at the text from a critical analysis perspective, we then can dissect the text in its many different parts to understand who's speaking and why they're speaking and to what purpose they're speaking. Um, there's also a sense that um, the prophet Jeremiah is at work within bringing um, the text together and speaking in this voice um, through Moses. And so it's, it's really important as, again, as you begin working through, and I know um, uh, uh, Reverend Barry has a slide that talks about all the kind of key points <clears throat> um, that are um, in the book. Reverend Barry, can you bring that up? You, it was slide eight, I believe, in your presentation. The okay, let me know if you can see it now. Uh-huh. Yeah. So when you look at this, you know, reconnecting with God's purpose, uh, reflecting on God's person, refocusing on God's way, responding to God's promises, these are messages that the priest wanted to make sure that the people understood. These are messages and constructs that the priest wanted to make sure that those who were the people of Israel would follow. And so Deuteronomy becomes that, that second law. You've got the first law that's delivered right, in Exodus, um, but you've got this as the second law, the Deutero law, the Deutero, the second law that the people of Israel are supposed to focus on in terms of what is right, what is proper, what are the, um, you know, religious um, ceremonies, what is the proper way in order to um, give thanks to God? And within that context, Jerusalem and the temple become the central theme. Jerusalem and the temple become where you meet God. Something else I, I, I wanna make sure I, I, I cover with this. Um, and you may have covered it already, uh, Reverend Barry, and that is there's this sense of um, a local God versus a omnipresent God. Yeah. So during the time of the writing, Israel had a sense of 
local God, right? So God lived in the temple, right? As a matter of fact, when we read the Psalms, it says, you know, um, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. We wept when we remembered Zion. And then it says, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Do you remember that? And they wrote that because of the fact that they believed that when they were in Babylonian captivity, God was still back in Israel. And so they no longer had God with them because they believed in this local God concept. God lived in the temple, right? Isaiah says, um, it was in the year that King Isaiah died that I first saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Again, that's imagery, but that's imagery of a local God living, abiding in. And when you move from Israel or Judah, God no longer is with you. It wasn't until what we call Deutero Isaiah or second Isaiah that you get this concept of a omnipresent God. And so Deuteronomy is this book that is given to us by the Levitical priesthood, written by the Levitical priesthood to express the concepts that Reverend Barry has laid out here. It is voiced through Moses, but it is the concepts and constructs of a Levitical priesthood because the people at that time needed something to bring them together, some, some structure, because again, you, you've got two different canons. You've got the, a canon that was being used in the Northern Kingdom of Israel and you had a canon that was being used in the southern kingdom of Judah. And this redactor, in this case, um, the Deuteronomistic historian brings those canons together into what we now read as Deuteronomy. Brother Ward, but, um, before you go on, I also wanna remind the students, you, if you have questions, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, for Brother Ward, as you, if you have a question about anything, just put it in the chat. Um, Brother Ward, I want you to, and you may have said it, but I want you to highlight, and just in case a student mm -hmm. has this question. So the Deut Deuteronomy is, you said, the second law. Right. What's the need? So last week uh, and week before class, remember we talked about um, Exodus, right? And Moses goes up and he gets these uh, Ten Commandments and he comes back down. He's like, y'all, this is what you need to be doing. This is what the Lord said. And um, uh, in, in our studies, we see, remember y'all, that the, the Israelites still acted a fool. <laughs> they still <laughs> acting like us. They still didn't get it right. So, Brother Ward, share with us in case a classmate is wondering, well, what's the purpose for the second? Yeah, that, that's a great question. The second law basically is a reiteration of the first law, but at the same time, giving it context in terms of contemporary context, right? So what the, what the Deuteronomistic historian is doing is he's taking the first law that's in Exodus, and he's building on that to say, we understand, you know, you've got the Decalogue, right? You've got the Ten Commandments. But in addition to the Ten Commandments, there are other things that God requires of us. And what Deuteronomy is focused on is what are those other things? What are those other um, religious um, rites and sacrifices? What are those other admonitions that God is requiring of us? 
and they are canonizing that in this text called Deuteronomy. Because quite frankly, you know, as Evan Berry said, the people weren't exactly always following the Decalogue, right? They weren't always following the Ten Commandments. And so Deutero, you get the second law that is delivered by Moses. And this is important. And again, I don't want us to get caught up in the fact that, you know, well, the book says these are the words of Moses. In ancient writing, it was, it was a very well-known practice that if you wanted to give um, heft, if you wanted to give weight to a specific text, you write it in the name of someone else. It was a, it was a school of writing that was done all the time, right? Um, as a matter of fact, that practice actually takes place in the New Testament as well. Um, so the priest wanted to provide a set of, of um, laws is not the best way of saying that. The priest wanted to provide a set of policies, a set of a polity around how Israel should conduct itself. Again, building on the Ten Commandments, but at the same time expressing much more kind of religious rights. And what Deuteronomy provides to us through Moses is this set of religious rights. And so it's a wonderful storyline that the priests create where Moses introduced Moses is the introductory person that gives you these new sets of, of, of laws and this new polity. And then at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses then passes off the scene, right? And so it's a, it's a literary tool. What the priests are doing is using Moses as a literary tool to introduce a set of Jewish policy and polity in terms of how people should govern themselves and what that means in terms of their relationship with God. So, um, Brother Ward, let's pause right there in essence of time and see we're at 11.50. So I want to, um, let me change my slide here. And students, you get your questions in the, um, okay, great, Marsha, I see your question there. Um, I want to get to the end mm -hmm. of Dute. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there were several discourses. We, won't, we don't, we won't go through all of them, but several discourses. And when we say discourses, speeches. That's right. That Moses had. Yep. Let's get to Okay, everybody, I'm coming right back to you. All right. So Moses had these discourses. And then uh in essence of time, let's let's head we'll uh chat about the end. And I want you to see something here. I'm gonna pull this up on the screen. Okay, let me know if you can see my PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. All right, we will, um, we won't go through all of these, but students, uh, Moses speaks a lot. As um, uh, Brother Ward says, this book is attributed to him and he is a definite main character in the book. He has three of these last discourses, these speeches, these things that he's got to get out, right, before he leaves the scene. So you have uh, a discourse in uh, chapter one, you have a discourse in chapter five, and then, uh, Towards the end, let me get here. 
y'all have your Bible open with you. Towards the end, we won't go through everything because it's quite long. Um, Brother Ward, I want you to hang towards the end of Deuteronomy. What's Moses says before he leaves the scene? Mm -hmm. um, if you could summarize, what is he sharing there? And then students, if you thumb through your Bible, if you thumb through your Bible in verses 31 through 34, we're really seeing that Moses couldn't have written the book because he did. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua is now on the scene and we're like, mm, this is additional information. We know that he didn't write this because he wasn't around. Okay, so um, get your questions in the chat, Brother Ward. You're going to tell us about that last part and then we'll open up for questions. Yeah, I think I think as you said that, you know, in in this particular part, again, the mindset is it's Moses speaking. But again, it's what the priests are trying to get across. And, um, and I'll do this. I'll get to hold on one second. Um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with chapter 27 here. Uh, Moses and the elders of Israel charged the people saying, observe all the instructions. And I'm, I'm, I'm reading from um, a Hebrew Bible. And so it may be, the wording may be different from the wording that you have. Um, Moses and the elders of Israel charged the people saying, observe all the instruction that I enjoin upon you this day. As soon as you have crossed the Jordan into the land that the Lord God has given you. And so again, it's, it's instructions in terms of how they are to behave and how they are to um, interact with themselves and with God. And then there's a series of, of blessings in chapter 28. Um, now, if you obey the Lord your God and absorb faithfully all the commandments which I enjoin to you, uh, and then he goes to this blessing, uh, right? So, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall you be in the issue of your room. Blessed shall you be. And so there's a series of blessings that come out of these admonitions, right? So, behave this way, and the Lord will bless you in this way. And it's important, again, because when you have the structure, um, being the structure of the priesthood, they wanted to make sure that people understood what is the right way. We have the Ten Commandments, but what is the right way that we should be interacting not only with between ourselves, but what is the right way that we should be interacting with God? And if we do that, these are the blessings that God will bestow upon us. Awesome. And as there are also said, some penalties in there as well, by the way. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. So there were some warnings. So before I wanted uh, students, I wanted you to see that. So before Moses uh, goes on to glory, he's like, look, I got to get this out. If you do what is right, you're definitely going to be blessed. But he mm -hmm. didn't want to sugarcoat things either, right? So he's he continues to talk about... Um, mm, their heart mm -hmm. and making sure that their heart is right. Um, uh, verse seven, I think I'm in Deuteronomy 30 and then I'm gonna come to y'all students. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemy who hate uh, who hate and persecute you. So then we see that um, transcend also into the New Testament as um, you know, Jesus is on the scene and talking about how to love um, enemies and, you know, um, well, we'll keep going. And you see, if you keep going, what is this? Um, is this the end of 30, the end of chapter 30? Does he die in end of chapter 30, I believe? Um, uh, 34, I think. 34. Okay, 34. Um, and so uh, our dear Moses is going on and so we see let's see here yes yes death of moses in chapter four yes um if you have your bibles open with you students if you see in chapter 34 verse one i just want you to see this in your mind's eye chapter 34 
verse one. Moses has done all of this wonderful work. And then it says in verse 134, then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah across from Jericho. Um, there, ooh, does this not get you? There the Lord, y'all see that? Showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan. Oh, ooh, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the Mediterranean Sea, that's big, y'all. The, the Negev and the whole region from the Valley of Jericho, the City of Palms, as far as Zor. And uh, I'm, I'm going to keep moving. This is the land that the Lord God promised um, to the people of Israel. But y'all, ooh, my heart is just so, ooh, go to verse 7. Moses was 120 years old when he died. So Moses, look, 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 look. Moses was shown the promised land. And doesn't it just give you the eerie, the, you, you remember the words of Dr. King? You know, I seen it. Might not get there with you. And Moses saw it, but couldn't get in. I don't know if that'll break your heart more, but oh, that's just, that's a whole nother discussion. Brother Wood, thank you so much. This was so rich. And we have uh, students, if you have any questions, we're going to pause and chat. Um, Reverend Marshall put in the text, is the text still God's, God's words, God's words or opinion? Which, uh, Reverend Marshall, is it our op or opinion? So I think to answer that question again, that goes back to the beginning. The text is inspired, but not inerrant, right? And so um, the text is written by man, but inspired by God. And so even through what we have and what we understand are the biases that are written into the text, God still speaks. And that's the way that, um, we interpret it is God still speaks. And the reality is what God wants from us is relationship, not religion. Many times we get caught up in religion and religious rites. And you could be, you could do a lot of things religiously, <laughs> right? But what God wants from us is relationship. And that relationship is built on the Bible as text, but don't make the Bible your God. The Bible is a roadmap to help build relationship with God. And we Many, saw that in the New Testament as absolutely. the Pharisees used it to beat people. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Don't make, don't worship the Bible. Worship God. Use the Bible as a vehicle worship that helps bring you in relationship with God. Awesome. Any other questions, any comments? You all can open your microphones. If you, if, if, if you have an opportunity at some point to um, get into um, what I mentioned before, JEPV analysis, um, which is also called the documentary hypothesis. What you'll see is that throughout the Torah, specifically throughout the Torah, there are many writers at work. And what happened is that when, again, when Israel comes back from Babylonian exile, there's a, a canon being used. There's a, a, a Hebrew Bible, if you will, being used in the Northern Kingdom of Israel written from the political perspective of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. There is another Hebrew Bible canon being used in the Southern Kingdom of Judah, written from the perspective, the political perspective of the Southern Kingdom of Judah. And you have what's called the redactor. And many people think that um, um, Ezra was the redactor. And what you have is the uh, the redactor actually takes these two different Bibles 
with two different perspectives and weaves them together into what we read as our Bible. And so that's why you have multiple creation stories. Within we talked text. about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, students, remember we talked about that in Genesis, those people who were with me in the, uh, for the New Testament course, we looked at, you know, how sometimes you may have something repeated. Uh, when we say redactor, that was the writer or the editor. Maybe they had uh, bad lighting. Maybe their pen broke. And uh, <laughs> so they're adding things in or you know, you meant to say this over here, but I like how uh, Reverend Marshall said, is it, is it, is it still God's word? Sure is. Mm -hmm. And remember the, the humans, the human beings are human. And as they're writing, um, as they're pulling these things together, Old and New Testament, Old Testament is even worse because, um, it's not like New Testament had computers, but um, Old Testament, it, it, it was just so very piecemeal. Right. And as Brother Ward was saying, as you're pulling, just imagine pulling little piece. I have the, I have, if I could show you my desk, I have all these little sticky notes all over my desk. But just imagine this was an Old Testament book and this was one and then we're trying to get this together and y'all can't half read what I got on here. And then y'all can't read that. And then they're trying to make sense of it. I would not want their job, would you? <laughs> that was a hard job. Rep Reverend Barry, just, just one last thing, and it goes along with the point that you were just making about the New Testament. We should also be aware that um, the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation did not make the first cut when the Bible was being canonized um, at the Council of Nicaea in 325. And the reason that it didn't make the cut is one of the... Um, criteria for uh, being included with in what we call the New Testament was apostolic authorship or apostolic relationship, meaning that there had to be some proof that the text was either written by one of the apostles or by someone who was closely uh, related to one of the apostles in terms of being one of their disciples. Uh, no one really knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, Although it's, it's a tribute. A woman, one time. Yeah. yeah, although it's attributed to several people. No one really knows who wrote the book of Revelation, although it's attributed to um, the apostle John. And so neither one of those texts were included in the first canon. They were later additions because of the fact that it was felt the weight of their writing was so important to the early Christian church that later um, councils in the church said, we have to include these back in. And so it was common practice to write in the name of someone else. So I don't, I don't want us to get caught up on that. It was common practice of ancient cultures to write in the name of someone else in order to give the text heft. That doesn't mean that God still isn't speaking through the text because God is. Thank you so much, Brother War. It has just been a pleasure to have you with us this morning slash afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, students, y'all okay? I know you're, uh, you're listening. Any questions, comments before we go? Thank you, Professor, and thank you, uh, lecturer. I enjoyed all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look, look hopefully y'all y'all will invite me back again at some point. <laughs> yes, we will. Yes, we will. <laughs> yes, we will. I'm so Ooh. thankful that you would thank you. Thank you again, Brother Boy, for joining us. So students uh, and those students who are watching, make sure this week you are working on the uh, Old Testament book outline. Um, and I won't see you next week. So remember the, oh, the next time I see you will be, yeah, I won't see you on the 24th, so I will see you on December 1st, and that is um, 
going to be, I believe, probably going to be our last session. And watch out for next week. I'll do a recorded lesson for you. OK, but happy Thanksgiving to you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Brother Ward. Thank you so welcome. welcome. We'll see Thank you later. Thank you, Brother Ward. Happy Thank Thanksgiving you. to everyone. All right. You as well. All right. Bye bye. Stay right there, Henri. Okay. Oh, let me hit stop recording. Hello, Miss Mary. Yes.